Working with Iconography, Classical Mythology, and Christian Imagery. Iconography is at the heart of the puzzle that constitutes meaning and artistic intention in art. All artists, even the most contemporary and experimental, can be approached iconographically. In the works and movements we are going to consider across the semester, we are going to learn and recognize specific symbols common in classical art and in Christian art. We are going to consider the way that imagery, such as the grape, becomes iconic, although its symbolism evolves as the motif is taken over by different artists and different religions. We'll explore how later artists appropriate motifs and use visual analogies to invoke religious iconography in secular contexts. Iconography, a term used in art history referring to the study of the subject matter rather than the form of a work of art. Iconographical analysis identifies the images and symbols used by the artist to depict a subject or theme. Although it can be used in connection with any period of art, iconography is most usually discussed in the context of medieval and especially Renaissance studies. Iconology. Iconology is interpretive, whereas iconography is essentially descriptive. Iconological analysis examines the meaning of an image or work of art by setting iconographical evidence into a historical, social, economic, or other context. The term was particularly advocated by the great German art historian Erwin Panofsky, 1892-1968. Artists did not invent iconography. They used symbols known to them through other works, manuscripts, and eventually printed books. Such compendia of iconographical patterns, allegories, symbols, personifications, were familiar resources in artists' workshops and well known to art patrons. Among the most important of these handbooks was Cesare Ripa's Iconologia, 1593, which was translated into numerous languages. Artists work closely with scholar priests, lay scholars, and even patrons to devise iconographic programs that expressed a desired iconological meaning. They also read the Bible, works of classical mythology, and theological treatises. Consider a key image of Christian iconography, the Madonna and Child, its sources in pagan antiquity, and its resonance in modern art. The mother and child is the central motif in any nativity or adoration. Paula di Noferi Strozzi commissioned this famous altarpiece showing the adoration of the Magi in 1423 for his family's chapel in the church of Santa Trinita in Florence. The story is at least a little familiar to most of us now. Then everyone would have known it in all its details. Illiterate Christians would have learned the story at church from the priest and through decorations such as murals and sculpture. Reading the Bible would have required a knowledge of Latin, but clergy and many aristocrats had the education to do this. Here is a much abridged version of the narrative from the Gospels of Luke and Matthew in the King James Version of the Bible. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And the angel said, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, for unto you is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The shepherds said to one another, Now let us go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, and stood over where the young child was. And they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The wealth and culture of the donor are reflected in the lavish use of gold and in the pomp of the Magi procession, and also in the inclusion of exotic animals such as leopards and monkeys. This altarpiece is sumptuous in its color and decoration, teeming with activity and realistic detail. Every bird and animal, every detail of the magnificent fabrics is represented with scrupulous delicacy and also with extreme psychological realism. Irreverent attendants exchange glances and jokes as their royal masters are caught up in the miracle. Some look with fascination at the birds. The midwives seem to examine a golden jar like guests at a bridal shower, as if to assess its value. In the background, dogs chase hares, horses prance and rear. One horse kicks another, who complains. Two soldiers waylay and mug a wayfarer. So the artist is telling a well-known and extremely important story. He is demonstrating in his materials and ambition the wealth, generosity, piety, and importance of his patron, Strozzi. And he is promoting himself, his accomplishments, his own erudition, and the quality of his workshop. Art has ever been reliant on the art that precedes it. Renaissance artists studied the art of the ancients, specifically the Greeks and Romans, for ideas and models. Here is a series of images of the Old Testament shepherd boy, hero, and eventually king, David. Consider two things. The first is how the artist thought through the narrative and selected a specific moment. That narrative is, of course, how the Philistines sent their great hero Goliath to battle whatever warrior the Israelites offered up. No soldiers step forward, only the young shepherd boy David. David rejects armor and sword, instead depending on his trusty slingshot to defeat Goliath. Compare the moments before, during, and after the battle that the artists have chosen to depict. Consider the iconographic details, the symbols each artist has provided. Contrast the qualities of direct realism and emotional expression in some with the use of elegant, idealized form and restraint of design in others. What if you had to judge which work was the most realistic and which was the most classical and idealized and rank them from one end of the spectrum to the other? In what order would they be, and why? The struggle between realism and idealized form has been underway since the inception of the idea of art. This is one topic we will revisit repeatedly throughout the semester.